tell me, first of all, what this report has uncovered. This report is really focused on the relationship between climate change, recent changes in, in things like air temperature, uh, and, and some of the underlying components of things like our wildfire models, our extreme heat models, and how that's related to second order derivatives, which, which we're thinking of as, as, as air quality pollutants. Uh, the EPA defines six different criteria pollutants, two of which they, they've already identified in the literature as being related to the changing climate. One of those is PM25, which is really, uh, in terms of the way we're exposed to it and climate, really is wildfire smoke, the increased frequency, the increased severity of wildfires that we're seeing, especially in the West, but also in the Southeast is producing more wildfire smoke or more emissions. And then the increased temperature uh, that we're seeing uh, across, the, across the country, really across the globe, but really in the US uh, is leading to uh, a, sort of an atmospheric chemistry interaction with, with existing pollutants, things like sulfur oxide, nitrous oxide, is producing more ground level ozone. So what we're seeing across the country is that while PM25 and ozone are impacting different parts of the country differently, we're seeing an increase in pollutants in the air due to our changing climate. Air quality, I know like in the 70s and 80s was like really bad, but didn't it get a little better for a while? Are we going back down again? Am I getting this wrong? Tell me what the trend has been over the last four decades yeah, or so. At the middle of the of the last century, you know, 1940s, 1950s, uh, the government really said, you know, air pollution's horrible. You know, we, we have all of these uh, black smog in the air, especially in cities. Uh, we have to do something about it. So there, there, there were a handful of regulatory policies that were implemented. Probably the most important one was the Clean Air Act in the 1960s, which has had a series of amendments added onto it. Uh, over time, but that Clean Air Act set forth a set of, of regulatory policies that were, were uh, um, designed to improve the air quality by removing pollutants from the air. Primarily, they set standards on things like automobile emissions, factory emissions, and those types of things. But what we ended up doing was over the last half a century, and even the first decade or so of this century, was really improving the air quality. We, we reduced the total suspended particles in the air dramatically. We, we've driven down PM25 uh, from anthropogenic sources, things like automobile emissions, factory emissions, uh, to the point to where some of those uh, pollutants we actually think are about as low as they can get. So, so you know, we, we did a really, really good job with regulatory policies. The, the problem is that in the last about decade, we've started to see, if you just look at the average metrics from the EPA stations, an increase in some of those pollutants. And really, uh, it's been referred to as the climate penalty. And, and it's a little bit troubling because when you talk about anthropogenic pollution, pollutants, you're talking about uh, car emissions and, and, and factory emissions, you can put regulation in place to try to control that. And that's something that we did a really good job of. When you talk about climate, it, we, that's proven a lot harder for us to try to regulate, even in regard to trying to reduce CO2 emissions. So if we're if we're now starting to see poor air quality driven by uh, uh, by climate exposure and increasing uh, um, uh, air temperatures and increasing frequency and severity of wildfires, then we, we we're really in a place where now we've almost lost the ability to control these air pollutants in a way that we've had in the past. That makes total sense, and I wasn't really thinking about it like because it, it, it climate comes from all these different directions. Like I, I was thinking about like my childhood and secondhand smoke and how it was like this is bad for our children's lungs so we're going to stop this and it'll change this so i know you're not a medical doctor but i'm curious are we putting like the next generation in danger the same way when it comes to what's going into their lungs and then also like you said it's so much harder to regulate it because it's not that coming from this one specific place right yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. Uh, since, just to put it all in perspective, since we've implemented the Clean Air Act, estimates are that we we prevented something like a quarter of a million heart attacks, something like 200,000 additional premature deaths. Uh, we, we've limited or prevented the loss of like 17 million uh, working days annually. So the economic impacts are impressive. And we've also limited uh, the loss of about 5.4 million lost school days for kids. So 
if you're, you know, your the health impacts are clear, the economic uh, activity and the productivity uh, is, is important, but also just the quality of life. When you think about, you know, kids not being able to go to school, not being able to participate in recreational activities, there are all these negative things that essentially we've reduced over the last, you know, 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, as we start to see these increases in poor air quality, essentially we're adding that back. We're, we're, if you think about it that way, we're going to be adding, you know, a quarter of a million additional premature deaths. We're going to be adding additional uh, uh, heart attacks. We're going to be adding additional lost work days, which lead to economic uh, uh, loss of economic productivity. So that when you think about it in those kind of tangible uh, forms, it does have a real uh, impact on, on both people from a health perspective, but also from an economic perspective for larger communities. So I'm curious about how you can attribute things to climate change, because it is, like I said, coming from all these different directions. How do you make that direct correlation? Yeah, that, you're, you're right. A lot of times when you think about it, it well, we're seeing an increase in, in one climate, climate outcome, and we're seeing an increase in this you know, negative implication. Potentially, they're related to one another. Maybe there's some smart theoretical ways why, how they can be connected. What we've done on our side is we, we've built all of our climate models as physically based models. So we're building out a physically based wildfire model. We're introducing uh, uh, drought conditions, fire weather, uh, wind patterns, uh, humidity patterns into the model itself. And then we're having the model produce the smoke emissions as part of the fire run. So for us, it, it, we're not really correlating things statistically or really focused on in regard to the production of our air quality model is producing those outcomes directly from the physics that go into the production of the wildfire model. So they're, 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 they're well, I guess from a, from a, from a positive uh, way of thinking about it, what we're seeing is aligning pretty well with some of those other statistical models that people are looking at, looking at satellite data of smoke and those kind of things. But we, we go all the way back to the actual physics model and let the, let the physical wildfire uh, produce the PM25 from the smoke specifically. At First Street, you guys are big on like really identifying locations. So are there parts of the country that are more susceptible to atrocious air than others? Yeah, there are. And it, there, there are really two stories here. One is that the ozone exposure is actually a lot broader than we, than we would have expected when we first started looking at the model. It, it, it impacts a really large geographic area. And ultimately, it ends up being located in places where there's just a lot of population. So the Midwest, uh, the Northeast are two of the places with really, really uh, um, a lot of ozone exposure. Uh, and then, then places like California also. Southern California also has a lot of poor air quality due to ozone uh, production. But what we're really seeing is that out West, when PM25 is produced from wildfires, uh, while it's not quite as broad of a of a scale spatially, so in terms of severity, it's much much more impactful. We're seeing the the impact of ozone maybe impact communities you know on the high end 12, 14, 15 days out of the year where there'll be poor air quality days associated with that. In some of the worst case scenarios in the Central Valley of California, for instance, we're seeing like Fresno County see about three months worth of poor air quality days in the current environment, primarily driven by PM25. So it really is a Western story, but there are pockets where, where, where the, the most extreme cases are going to see you know, upwards of a quarter of the year of, of poor air quality days in the current environment. Um, can it forecast events or is it broader than that? Like, is, is there any ability for it to forecast like a short term upcoming event? Uh, it, 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 we don't forecast shortcoming up, uh, upcoming events. What we've done is tie it to the actual probability of an extreme heat wave in the Midwest and Northeast, for instance, or wildfire frequency and severity. So you think about it kind of as like a one in a hundred year event annually. And if that one in a hundred year event hit annually, how much smoke would that one in a hundred year event produce? And so we're able to do that for any given location, but we're not able to say, over the next, you know, two weeks, you could expect to see uh, poor air quality day. I know that um, like Pace is launching tomorrow, um, and that's going to provide a lot of information about like wildfire smoke and where it's moving around the country. Are you hoping to utilize that information at all and incorporate it into the model? 
Absolutely. Yeah, we're so our, our wildfire smoke is built directly off of our our wildfire model, but we do also bring into these models uh, other research that, that is focused, for instance, on satellite data and identifying wildfire smoke from from satellites uh, uh, into the past. And then what we really do is we're trying to project that into the future using our own model to produce what we're calling a change factor attached to that. But at First Street, we're always looking to, 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 to use government resources, to use other researchers' information that have already done this work and, and, and build off of it in a way that just makes it tangible to people. Are you hoping that they'll do the same? Yeah, I mean, we're hoping that people use use our data as a way to understand, um, you know, how how to how to make this relevant for communities, how to make this relevant for uh, property owners, how to scale this into the future using physically based uh, models. So I, I know there there are a lot of different approaches, a lot of different ways of thinking about producing uh, wildfire models, smoke models, ozone models, and you know taking advantage of all of those different resources is beneficial to everyone. Yeah. And they, I mean, the government has a huge push like with NOAA with communication too. So I guess I'm curious as far as like where you want this to go. Are you hoping that this will go into like a communication realm where it will get communicated to the public in a way that's helpful in the future? And how, what does that look like? Yeah, for, for us, we, we always build out our, our own models into a, a public facing tool called riskfactor.com. We're, we're adding into riskfactor.com air factor, which will, which will uh, be added to our wind model, our heat model, our wildfire model, and our flood model. So now we'll also have a, an air quality model where individuals can go on, they can type in their address, they can understand risk to their specific property. For air quality, we know it's a little bit more disparate than that. So they can go on and they can they can understand the rest of their communities. And really what that that has given us is we've built out this this communication tool. Is there are a lot of things or uh, some of our hazards are really focused on specific damages to the property, things like flood, wildfire, wind. But then there are things like heat and air quality, which while you may not be impacted by a wildfire directly, you may live in a community that has smoke from wildfires that happen outside of that community. So there, there are kind of these downstream effects uh, of climate hazards that we're also trying to incorporate in a way uh, to raise awareness around, around the exposure that doesn't have to be property specific and physically damaging. What's next? I feel like you have kind of covered all of the models at this point. You're going to have like an algal bloom model next. Like there's nothing left. <laughs> yeah. Internally, we, we are uh, still working on a drought model. So we're building that out and, and trying to understand what the climate signals are uh, attached to that. As you know, one of the biggest problems with studying drought is we've been in this, this drought that's, that, that essentially has been lasting, you know, decades and decades, if not longer. And trying to model out almost micro trends within that is uh, is proving to be difficult, but we're working on that. And then we're really starting to pivot our attention towards uh, implications. You know, what does this mean for climate migration? What does this mean for uh, potential tax revenues and the ability of communities uh, to be able to respond to these hazards in the future if, if property values drop or places become less desirable? So we're really starting to orient towards uh, towards those implications types of analyses. But we also, as you know, half of our company here are climate scientists and they're focused on constantly improving uh, the models that we already have. So we'll, we'll continue to improve our flood model, our wildfire model, our heat model. And now we're just gonna spend a little bit more time uh, focusing on what are the implications of exposure to those, those different hazards today and into the future. Hey, thank you so much for watching. While you're here, check out some other videos you just may like.